Hi folks, today I'm going to be talking about the Oort Cloud. I get asked a lot how I can even know that the Oort Cloud exists. We can't see it directly, we can't take pictures of it, because it's much too far from the sun to see. There's just not enough light out there from the sun uh, to be reflected back for us to see its members. Well, that's true in terms of members that are far from the sun, but we do see individual members of the Oort Cloud when they come close to the sun. We call them long period comets. Now, Back in 1950, Jan Oort published a paper describing a hypothesis about how the Oort cloud could have come into existence. And this has become generally accepted as the formation of the Oort cloud, and it's why the Oort cloud bears his name. But he was not the first to propose the existence of a cloud of comets surrounding the sun. This is a common misconception with a lot of people. In fact, you can even find this misconception in some scientific programs as well. But in truth, he was not the first to make the suggestion. Uh, even within his paper where he proposes this hypothesis, he cites earlier work that looked at alternative solutions to a problem that was plaguing astronomy back then, and that was the eccentricity of long-period comets. Long-period comets that have very long orbital uh, periods have eccentricities still around one or so. Some are a little bit hyperbolic, but not strongly hyperbolic. Uh, what's an example of a strongly hyperbolic orbit? Well, the Voyager probe would be one such example. The Voyager probe has left the vicinity of the planets and it's passed through the heliosphere, but it still hasn't reached the Oort cloud, but even so, it's away from the planets, and even now, its eccentricity is still much greater than three. That's way, way higher than any long period comet that has ever been seen. And this was considered a problem back then, because if comets had an interstellar origin, if they came from other solar systems or just a general homogeneous field of comets that permeated the galaxy between the stars, we would expect them to have interstellar velocities, velocities quite dissimilar from the Sun, uh, much more like the Voyager probe. But that did not appear to be the case. In fact, that never appeared to be the case. Consistently, we saw that comets shared the Sun's velocity and had eccentricities only around one or so. And they tried to find explanations for this. Earlier work looked at the possibility that the planets themselves had captured the comets into highly eccentric orbits, but essentially the Sun and the solar system had accrued a cloud of comets around it. That's right, Oort was not the first to propose the notion of a cloud of comets uh, surrounding the solar system, and as I say, earlier work was trying to determine why that cloud existed. We knew it existed because we could look at the orbital periods of these comets, we could look at the semi-major axis of their orbits, and we could see how far they got from the Sun, and the fact that they spent most of their time far from the Sun. They only spend a small fraction of their time close to the Sun, and they're continually, continually coming on. Throughout human, human history, we have seen long period comets with these uh, eccentricities all around one. And so, Oort was the first to propose a solution uh, that enabled us to understand that the, the comets could have formed with the solar system. And uh, it was a problem that we really began realizing uh, when astronomers began realizing that the Sun and the solar system is not stationary in the galaxy. If it were a homogeneous field of comets between the stars and we were just running into them, we would expect there to be a, a larger amount of comets coming from the direction of the Sun's travel through the galaxy than the antipode. But this was not the case. They appear to be relatively evenly distribu distributed all around the Sun. And that was a big problem. So Oort was the one to solve that and that's why it bears his name, but he was not the first to suggest its existence, and its existence it can be directly derived by looking at the orbits of comets. So, if we look at the orbits of uh, long period comets that happen to be relatively close to the Sun right now, these uh, comets are from the Minor Planet Center's currently observable list. Now the list does include comets that aren't actually currently observable. A good example of this would be C2010X1 element, which disintegrated on its approach to the Sun. Uh, but nevertheless, this list limits itself to comets that have been observed in about the last decade or so, and that's why uh, that one makes the list. It doesn't, uh, they don't eliminate them from the list if they disintegrate. Uh, but the, it's still only a small sample of the comets that we've seen, long period comets throughout human history. It's only a sample of the last decade or so. So just keep that in mind. We're only looking here at a tiny, tiny fraction of long period comets, but what we're going to see is the fact that the Oort cloud does exist and can be uh, detected by looking at the orbits of long period comets. So the outer circle, this circle here, is the orbit of Neptune 
So I just want you to see how that scale looks here. And I'm going to zoom out. And right now I've decluttered the orbits as much as possible. So that's why you see these little dashes. These are sections of long period uh, com cometary orbits. Uh, but I've tried to limit their visibility as much as possible so that you can clearly see the orbit of Neptune. Now, as I zoom out, I'm going to turn on those orbits. And you can see them now. And we're going to run this integration forward. Now, back in 1950, uh, when Oort made his hypothesis, they didn't have this kind of computing power. This is uh, ORSA. And in this program, it calculates the effect of the gravity of the planets on all of these comets, about 250 of them. And that's computing power he didn't have back then. And so they were trying to investigate this with uh, fairly primitive tools, that, that only what they had available. And the easiest way to look at uh, what the true long period orbits of these comets uh, looked like without gravitational perturbations of the planets was to try to find comets that were found early on before the gravity of the planets could really perturb them so that they wouldn't have to undergo uh, detailed computations based on the gravity of the planets to try to uh, determine what the orbit was like free of those perturbations. But even just doing that, he was able to see that indeed the sun was surrounded by this cloud of comets and that these comets shared the sun's velocity. And we can do that now with a modern desktop quite easily using ORSA right here. So I ran this integration over the last, uh, about the last three days or so. And it's now ready, and we're going to play it here and take a look at what happens. Each frame is one century of time. And you can see almost right away that the sun is surrounded by this cloud of long period comets in every direction. Now, uh, do ignore the NPC codes over here. The positions of each comet are, are marked by a small blue dot. And next to that blue dot is the name, for instance, C2012V1 Panstars. If you follow that further over, eventually you'll hit an NPC code. It's just a whole long line of spaces between the name and the NPC code. I just I just uh, loaded this as a batch file from the Minor Planet Center, so it's got these MPC codes on it, but that doesn't actually show where the comet is. It's this first name over here on the left uh, that shows where the comets are. And as you can see, most of these comets have orbits. They're still bound to the sun. Those are the comets that have uh, a white line attached to them. Uh, other comets, which are hyperbolic, are not attached to any lines. For instance, C2012 S1 Ison. Now, Ison is another example of a comet which disintegrated uh, at perihelion. But had it stayed intact, it would have been a hyperbolic comet. And you can see that there is no line attached to it because it has no, uh, it has no orbit, effectively. It's not orbiting the sun in, in, uh, as far as Ors is concerned. It's hyperbolic. It's heading away from the sun and not gravitationally bound to it. Uh, but most of the comets that you see on these long period orbits uh, are still gravitationally bound to the sun, and they will come back after thousands of years. Now I'm going to go ahead and fast forward to the end of the integration here, which is over 100,000 years later. And you can see, even just using the comets that are have been uh, observable in the last decade or so, that the sun is indeed surrounded by a cloud of comets, most of whom will eventually return to the inner solar system again. And this is only a tiny, tiny fraction of what we've seen throughout human history. For thousands of years, man has been observing comets. And you can check uh, books on this. Uh, Gary Cronk has published uh, several volumes which are very nicely detailed on basically every comet ever seen in human history. And if possible, he's computed orbits for them. Uh, the Chinese astronomers were pretty good at keeping records of these things and where they were in the sky. And using that information, he was able to uh, generate orbits for a lot of those ancient comets. So you can even go back and add more comets to this if you wanted to. But even just using the last 250 or so uh, long period comets from the last decade or so, you can see that indeed there is a cloud of comets surrounding the sun from all directions. And that's what was known even before Oort made his hypothesis. Now there's also a second population of comets which are closer in. You can see their aphelion distances are much closer to the sun uh, than the population we were just looking at. And these generally originate from the Kuiper Belt and that region of space. But there's a whole other population of comets which have even longer orbital periods, and those come from the Oort cloud. That's what we're seeing here. Uh, so if we take a look, we can get exact data on how far some of these are from the sun. Uh, let's see, what would be a good example? C2014 W6 Catalina. Let's take a look at that. So if we go in here, we can graph out the distance 
of that comet relative to the Sun. So you can see that one is now 8,000 astronomical units from the Sun at the end of the integration. And it's basically reaching its aphelion distance. So there you go. So there's an example of a, an Oort cloud comet. There's plenty of others as well. I mean, like, here's one that has an aphelion distance of about 50,000 astronomical units or so. Yeah, between 40 and 50,000 astronomical units. So yeah, a lot of these comets have very, very high distances uh, from the Sun at their furthest point from the Sun. And they spend most of their time that far from the Sun. So here you go. For thousands of years, for tens of thousands of years, it's well, well away from the Sun. It's thousands of astronomical units away in the Oort cloud. It spends most of its time out there and only a small fraction of its time close to the Sun. So this was something that was known to astronomers long before Oort made his proposal. Oort's proposal was more about how it came to be. He came up with a hypothesis that it did indeed form with our solar system, and that's what made him famous. That's how he got his name on the Oort cloud. But even if you dispute his hypothesis, the, the notion that the Oort cloud exists is still not even in dispute, because we can see it directly from the orbits of the long period comets. And of course, even those comets are only a fraction of the total bodies that would be out there. We can only see the ones that come close enough to the sun to start lighting up and allow us to uh, discover them as they start outgassing. Uh, other objects will undoubtedly remain undiscovered uh, for all time because they never come close enough to the sun to outgas, and they're too small to reflect enough light for us to see. Uh, but they're certainly out there, and even if even if there weren't, there would still be a cloud of comets just from the ones that come into the solar system that we do see. So now uh, I hope that explains a lot and uh, answers a lot of your questions about this because I get asked about it fairly frequently. So uh, with that, clear skies and have a nice day.